All right, next we're going to have Joe Nash, who's going to come up here and talk about not being afraid to dream a little bigger. There is that, and there is that. Thank you very much. This isn't my slide, but it's kind of appropriate. The world is big. There we go. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Joe Nash, and I'm a developer advocate at a company called Improbable. Um, you might not have heard of us, but I'll tell a little bit about a project that you may have heard of. Um, so I'm here to talk about dreaming a little bigger, and I mean in terms of the scope of your games, in terms of what you're able to achieve as indie developers. As indie developers, we're bound by constraints, both in resources, in terms of time and money. You may be a student still studying and trying to build a game on the side, or you may have to uh, sustain a job in order to fund your development. Also constrained in terms of talent, not as in you're not all incredibly talented individuals, but as in we're small teams. We, are, we have to have a small team by necessity, uh, so we are constrained with the bandwidth we have. So building games of huge scale when we're talking... Uh, even something like an MMO or an open world survival game is an incredibly difficult thing to do, both in terms of the technical challenge of building a complex networked game or in terms of the content challenge. If we're thinking about a typical MMORPG, what you're looking at there is usually a static world of a huge amount of content. It requires hundreds of people and lots and lots of resources. But I want to talk a little bit about how we can overcome those challenges. So we look at a variety of games um, and how they try to achieve a large, open and immersive world um, and how they don't quite make it there, but how we can make it there in the future. So the first one is GTA. And GTA is a fantastic example of a world that feels very immersive to the players. As game developers, we want to immerse our players. We want them to feel like they're part of a world which is living and breathing with them, that they have a change on the world, that they can wreak effects. GTA comes very close to doing that, except it does that in a very limited bubble. The world only exists while you're walking through it. You have that odd moment sometimes when you kind of outpace the uh, procedural generation engine and you stand and you're walking around and like there's no cars there and then slowly you see a line of identical cars proceeding up the highway. Um, and that's as the simulation is kicking up around you. So it does a really good job of having a really deep world, but it's only around the player. And then we look at the other end of the spectrum, one of my favourite games of all time, Dwarf Fortress, which is just, oh, if you haven't played it, do. It's pain and suffering all in a delicious package. Um, and this is the complete opposite. Dwarf Fortress is a game which has an incredibly high fidelity simulation. There, like every single NPC and entity and creature and mouse in this game has a complex and rich life, but you can't experience any of that because you're in your little fortress bubble, and those creatures all live out for the duration of their lifetime, and those effects, the things they do in their lives, may have a chance to affect you in your fortress bubble but equally they may not, and you may never see that experience. So this is an incredibly high-fidelity simulation, which we are locked into a certain part of. And we can experience a lot of that in our bubble, but not as much as we may want to have. So it's the opposite to GTA, where you can roam the entire world, but the uh, simulation is shallow. Here the simulation is deep, but we're trapped to a certain part of it. And this is a good example. So GTA is obviously a huge studio. Uh, Dwarf Fortress is essentially one guy, Toadie One, just building this for decades. And he's built a very, very good simulation. So next up we have... Uh, MMOs, so this is what I was talking about earlier when we talk about um, the kind of static world. So a typical MMORPG is a bit like a theme park, right? Like you queue up, you get on your ride, you slay the boss, you get off the ride, the world resets. Nothing we do matters, nothing really has an effect. As we're starting to get into things like EVE and uh, PvP elements, you can start to have a player in your world, but typically they're static, you can't interact with much of the world outside of quests, outside of NPCs, and it requires a lot of content. So it's largely out of the reach of indie developers. And then we get to the other end where we're talking about games that have uh, very rich procedurally generated worlds, but they're hard to share with other players. They're typically generated from seeds. So two players may be able to experience the same planet, uh, but it's not the same instance of that planet. If I come in here and slay that monster, no one's going to find its bones later because they'll come to a different instance of that world. Um, and I, ironically, the thing that kind of overcomes all of these uh, limitations and kind of blends most of these together is actually the closest I can find is pretty much Agario. This is one huge persistent world where what you, does, uh, what you do matters. It affects other players. It has reasonably advanced simulation and you can play with many, many people in one seamless environment. And that is not the way this should be. We should be able to ha blend all those elements together ourselves and create these rich experiences that we want to. So I'm going to skip this next slide. Cool. So... What we have here with these games I've spoken about is the illusion of worlds. We have limited bubbles of simulation, or we have sharding and instancing where, where it's not seamless and we have to go through uh, those little like, dungeon portals and where our uh, effects are limited only to the space they're in, the theme park rides that were. Um, or we have procedural generation where it is a very rich and deep simulation, but it's only for us and we can't share that with other players. So none of this is the sort of worlds that we want to provide with people, and that's 
for a variety of reasons, the main one being technical challenge. But we can start to overcome those technical challenges now. And as developers, I don't know how much time I've got left, by the way. Um, and as developers, there are more and more tools available for us to do this. We're starting to see abstractions which make uh, starting to do more complex things cheaper and easier, obviously with a variety of game engines available, but also in platforms um, that remove the need for networking complexity. So I want to talk to you a little bit about one of those, which is... Um, Spatial OS, which is our one. So this is uh, the hope. We built this in the hope that we could build um, full, high-fidelity simulations for thousands of players in one seamless world. So we're talking about ecologies of creatures that live and die like Dwarf Fortress, but that can be shared with players in an MMO sort of a situation with full physics and full persistence. Part of the reason that these MMOs are so driven by static, com uh, static content is that the you can't have these... like rich physical experiences which enable players to create their own gameplay. So if you think of games like Gang Beasts, that's essentially jelly babies with floppy arms. And it's immensely entertaining and replayable because from simple physical rules, the players can create their own gameplay, right? So we want to bring that experience to MMOs scale games and in a way that's easy for developers and cheap for developers. So we're working with a company, I'm sure you've heard of them, Bossa Studios, they made Surgeon Simulator, they made Iron Bread. Um, they're now making a MMO called Worlds Adrift, which is there's no better way to sum it up than steampunk pirate ships that fly and can shoot each other out of the sky. It's just an unbelievably cool game, and it's all physics-driven. So you build these frames of your pirate ships, and you bolt the pieces on, you take off into this infinite sky, and you blow up other pirate ships. And there's ecologies of living manta rays that like fly around, and they cause havoc, and there's giant space whales. And it's just an indescribably awesome game. It's like a, kid, it's like a kid's fantasy. Um, and this is coming out soon, a couple of months, in fact. And this is a world that is... Oh, that's a walkthrough, I can't do that one. Cool, this is a world that's the size of Israel, or Wales, whichever is more relatable, they're the same size, fun fact. Um, it's an absolutely massive world, and it's entirely seamless. You can fly from one end of the world to the other. It has full ecologies of creatures that like live and die and evolve. Um, it has up to tens of uh, 10,000 players in a single instance of that world, and millions of persistent physical entities. And when I say persistent, I mean that like if you blow up someone's ship, the remains of that ship will stay on an island to be salvaged by a later player two years down the line. Your effects actually can be felt on matters, and if there's a huge battle, the remains of that battle will lay around for someone to find and wonder about the stories that were created there, what happened here that led this wreckage here. And this has been built by a team of five developers and eight artists, and there is not a single line of networking code in this game. That is just something that has not been achievable before. As these developers, they did an internal game jam and they thought, oh, this would be a cool game if we could have steampunk flying pirate ships. And they just couldn't build that. They would never have a hope of building that as that, a team that's small. But they were able to, for using modern abstractions and modern technology that removed all of the pain. Cool, thank you. That removed all of the pain and were able to let them dream a little bit bigger. Um, so we are starting to get, oh, this is a clip of the persistence. That's not where that slide should be. Wonderful. Um, so... Uh, and the next thing about that is that you don't uh, release a large online game, right? You launch a large online game, and then it requires years of upkeep, um, upkeep and maintenance, and making sure that thing runs. These platforms also come with additional fault tolerance. So we're talking about, oh yeah, so Unity 3D likes to crash, fun fact. Um, so we're talking about uh, a massive game with thousands of instances. So Unity can only handle about 2,000 pathfinding algorithms, for example. Whereas if you've got an ecology of creatures in your game that may be doing pathfinding across like 60,000 creatures, one Unity instance can't handle that. And obviously one Unity instance can't handle the physics of all of these flying pirate ships over a uh, 20,000 square kilometer world. So uh, we run thousands of Unity instances in the cloud, and if one goes down, the platform detects that and just seamlessly spins one back up. The platform is self-sustaining and healing, so your game will always be maintained by itself. You don't have to worry about devoting hundreds of infrastructure engineers to doing 24-7 shifts. As an indie developer, you can build very large games without having to ruin your life uh, balance or maintaining your servers. DevOps is not a thing, people. It's 2016. We can get away from this. Um, and that's basically what I wanted to say. Uh, we can make better online games. If you want to find out how, come chat to me. Um, there are a variety of tools to help you do this, and I'm around for the rest of the day to talk about that. Um, so thank you very much. You can sign up, especially us there, if you're interested. <laughs>